Open your King James Bibles to Matthew chapter 10 and verse 16. Jesus speaking. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues. Do you know what it means to be scourged? It means to be whipped and beaten. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues. Who hangs out in the synagogues? Verse 18. And ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. Do we need a second witness? Mark 13. Mark 13 is the parallel account of Matthew 24. Matter of fact, let's take a look and read the whole thing. Okay, Mark 13, and chab, verse 1. And as he, this is Jesus, and as he went out of the temple, one of his disciples saith unto him, Master, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here? And Jesus answering said unto him, Seest thou these great buildings? There shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And that was fulfilled in 70 AD when the Roman army under General Titus came and destroyed the rebellion by the Jews in Jerusalem and absolutely destroyed the temple. So... I've mentioned it many times in previous studies, but I got to say it again because I never know if this is a new listener listening to this. When the Jews tell you that the Wailing Wall was part of the temple, they are denying what Jesus said in verse 2. There shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. You have a choice. Are you going to believe Jesus? Or are you going to believe the Jews? with their thrusting pelvis at the wailing wall. So, all right, let's read the parallel account in Matthew 24 real quick. Verse 1, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, Jesus sat upon the Mount of Olives. This is where he's coming back one day. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming? and of the end of the world. So they're asking, what's going to be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? Well, Jesus is right there. He hasn't left yet. And yet they're asking, what's going to be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? So I guess we could read a little bit here. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. All right, let's go back to Mark 13 and see what they have to say. All right, so, so the uh, Matthew 24, most probably one of the most famous end time verses in the uh, chapters in the Bible is paralleled in 13, okay? So, 
let's see. Mark 13, chapter 13, verse 3. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives over against the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign when all these things shall be fulfilled? Okay, they're asking him basically, you know, the same thing they asked in Matthew 24. And Jesus answering them began to say, Take heed lest any man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And when ye shall hear of wars and rumors of war, wars, be ye not troubled, for such things must needs be, but the end shall not be yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. Well, that was most certainly fulfilled in World War I and World War II. And some say there's going to be a World War III. Uh, and there shall be earthquakes in divers places. Oh, there's been a lot of earthquakes lately. And there shall be famines and troubles. You know, people, let me tell you what. When Jesus warns that there's going to be famines, it'd be a good idea to listen to him, you know? Prepare a little bit. And there shall be famines and troubles. These are the beginnings of sorrows. But take heed to yourselves, for they shall deliver you up to councils, and in the synagogues ye shall be beaten. Ooh. For they shall deliver you up to councils, and in the synagogues ye shall be beaten, and in the synagogues ye shall be beaten, and ye shall be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them. And the gospel must first be published among all nations. But when they shall lead you and deliver you up, take no thought beforehand what ye shall speak. In other words, you know, when they take you, don't, don't, don't worry about what you're going to say. Okay? Neither do ye premeditate. For whatsoever shall be given you in that hour, that speak ye, for it is not ye that speak, but the Holy Ghost. So keep your mind blank. Don't think about what you're going to say. The Holy Ghost will speak through you. And I'll tell you what, people, that, that is 100% proof you're saved. When, when words come out of your mouth that you didn't say, that proves you're been born again of the Spirit. Now the brother shall portray the brother to death and the father of the son, and children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth, but he that endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. All right, let's take a look at Luke chapter 12 and verse 9. But he that denieth me before men shall be denied before the angels of God. So if you deny Christ to save your life, when you meet Christ, you're going to be denied before the angels of God. Not a good thing. You don't want to hear these words. I never knew you. You don't want to hear those words from Christ's mouth. But he that denieth me before men shall be denied before the angel of God. And whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. Praise the Lord, because I tell you what, I spoke a word against Christ when I was a teenager and fell away. But I wasn't so much blaspheming him as I was the uh, fake churches that I didn't understand back then. And whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But unto him that blasphemeth against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven. 
And when they bring you unto the synagogues and unto magistrates and powers, take ye no thought how or what thing ye shall answer, for what ye shall say, for the Holy Ghost shall teach you in the same hour what ye ought to say. All right, turn to John chapter 16. These things have I spoken unto you, that ye should not be offended. They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you, that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. And these things will they do unto you, because they have not known the Father, nor me. In John 15.25, but this cometh to pass, that the word might be fulfilled, that is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. And, uh, matter of fact, let's take a look. John 15. In verse 16. John chapter 15, verse 16. Jesus speaking, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you, that ye should go forth and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name. You ever wonder why they always want to change it to Yeshua, the name of Jesus? My Bible says Jesus, and the Greek New Testament was written in Greek. That says Jesus. Maybe they don't want your prayers to be answered. That whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you, that ye love one another. If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. This is not the Bible study that I was going to do. Uh, I mean, it, it's along the same lines. The uh, Jewish Jesuit connection. But in the BBC News, and if you want the link, I have the link in the description below the uh, on this uh, on this Bible study. And I got some links. You could take a look at it. And you can look it up yourself so that you don't think I'm telling you a lie. But the, uh, let's see, BBC News, the British Broadcasting Corporation, or uh, the B could stand for blind. But the headline is, Anti-Semitism, Official Definition Will Fight Hatred. Ooh. So let's read some excerpts. The government plans to adopt an international definition of anti-Semitism to help tackle hatred towards Jewish people. Police councils, universities, and public bodies can adopt the wording Theresa May has said. The International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, which the UK belongs to, created the definition. Ooh. Do you know that you can go to prison in many foreign countries for saying, how could six million Jews have died in the Holocaust? I mean, you look at the population numbers before the war and after the war, and they're awful close. Oh, that just got me banned in France, Germany, England, uh, and a bunch of other countries. So, what is the definition? It calls anti-Semitism a 
perception of Jews, which may be expressed as hatred toward Jews. Huh. Now, let's see. Uh, well, I don't want to read all this article, but it says, uh, and the definition continues saying, rhetorical and physical manifestations of anti-Semitism are directed towards Jewish or non-Jewish individuals and or their property toward Jewish community institution and religious facilities. So I guess when you find out that the Lubavitch rabbis, um, after they perform a circumcision, use their mouth to suck the blood off the baby's penis, I guess that could be considered anti-Semitism. I would be guilty, wouldn't I? If you show people that they're doing this, huh? Um, all right, so it says here, police in the United Kingdom already use this definition, which was adopted by the EU, the European Union's Agency for Fundamental Rights. Um, so, uh, this is backed by 31 different countries, including the uh, England, the United States, Israel, France, and Germany. And they hope that it'll, the definition will be adopted globally as a political tool to deal with anti-Jewish hate crimes. Ooh. Mrs. May said, and I quote, It is unacceptable that there is anti-Semitism in this country. It is even worse that incidents are reportedly on the rise. As a government, we are making a real difference in adopting this measure is a groundbreaking step. Unquote. Sorry, I, I can't do a female voice very well. So, uh, let's see. Let's see. Sir Eric Pickles, the UK's envoy for post-Holocaust issues, told BBC that the new definition addressed modern forms of anti-Semitism. He said that holding Jewish people accountable for what's happening in Israel was one example. Oh, so when the Israeli army is slaughtering unarmed Palestinians that are Christians, we can't hold Jewish people accountable for that. After all, that's anti-Semitism, right? You know, the Palestinians don't have an army. They don't have a navy. They don't have an air force. And yet they're bombed by Israeli planes made in the USA, given to them by the United States. And a lot of them are Christians. And if you think God's going to bless America for doing this, well, whatever. Um, let's see. Ephraim Mervis, the chief rabbi of the UK and the Commonwealth, welcomed the move for tackling what he called a, quote, scourge on our society. It's a scourge, unquote. Uh, let's see. All right, what else? Do you realize that every single Pre-trib rapture believing so-called church will tell you that Mark chapter 13 and Matthew 24, the ones that I just read where it says you'll be taken up to the synagogues to be beaten, they, they'll tell you, oh, well, that's that doesn't apply to us. We're New Testament Christians. That's for the unbelieving Jews that come to Jesus in the end times. I'm like, what? Matthew 24 and Mark 13, Jesus is talking to believers in him. I mean, he says, you're going to be taken up to the synagogues. I mean, every single pre-trib rapture preacher will tell you, well, that doesn't apply to us because we're not going to be here when all this happens. Really? So Jesus is talking to unbelievers who become believers in the futures? In the future, really? Uh, we'll see. Okay. All right, let's go to the 
Oh, one more thing. I just did a Google search, and you could do the same thing. The uh, H-A-A-R-E-T-Z, it's a news, Israeli news source. It's a, I don't know how to pronounce it. Herits, hearts, whatever. It has a headline in one of its news articles. Why is Greece the most anti-Semitic country in Europe? Well, you know, the thing is, the New Testament was written in Greek. The whole entire New Testament was written in Greek. The book of Ephesians, Colossians, Galatians, uh, Greek cities, churches in Greek cities. The New Testament was written in Greek. Of course, they know what the Bible says. And you'd be surprised. A lot of the Greeks are Christians. They, I, from what I've heard from Greek people, that's it's a lot more um, Christian than the United States ever thought about being. They know their history. So what can I tell you? And yes, I have a link to the article so that you can read it yourself. It's in the description of the video. All right, so let's take a look. Let's take a look at the Jewish Encyclopedia. The article is Jesus of Nazareth. The sub-paragraph is in Jewish legend. And I'm going to quote. So if I mispronounce words... That doesn't take away from what they're saying. Now, this is Jesus from a Jewish, non-believing perspective. The Jewish legends in regard to Jesus are found in three sources, each independent of the others. In New Testament Apocrypha and Christian Polemical -E -E Works. Two, in the Talmud and the Midrash, that's the Jewish oil, oral traditions. And three, in the life of Jesus, uh, told, T-O-L-E-D-O-T, told dot Yeshu, Y-E-S-H-U. And by the way, Yeshu, Y-E-S-H-U, is uh, like taking the first letters of, uh, in the, in the probably, I don't know, Hebrew or Yiddish. And it means, if you look up Yeshu in the Jewish Encyclopedia, it means, may his name be blotted out from under heaven. They call Jesus Yeshu. And isn't it funny how the Messianic Jews just add a little, tiny little A on the end of Yeshu, and then they say, oh, Yeshua. Hmm. May his name be blotted out with an A on the end, right? And in the life of Jesus told out Yeshu that originated in the Middle Ages. It is the tendency of these sources to be to belittle the person of Jesus by ascribing to him illegitimate birth, magic, and a shameful death. So here it is. The, um, the Jews say that Jesus had an illegitimate birth. Not the Holy Ghost, that's for sure. Magic, uh, see, that, that's the thing. The Jews admit that Jesus performed miracles. They just say that he did it by magic, by Kabbalah. And a shameful death. In view of their general characteristic, they are called indiscriminately legends. Some of the statements as that referring to magic are found among pagan writers and Christian heretics, such as the Ebionites or Judeo-Christians, who for a long time lived together with the Jews, are also classified as heretics. So Judeo-Christians, according to the Jewish Encyclopedia, are also classified as heretics. Conclusions may be drawn from this as to the origins, origin of these legends. Uh, it ought also to be added that many of the legends have a theological background for Paul Michael Paul Michael 
purposes, it was necessary for the Jews to insist on the illegitimacy of Jesus as against the Davidic descent claimed by the Christian church. Magic may also have been ascribed to him over against the miracles recorded in the Gospels and the degrading fate both on earth and hereafter of which the legends speak may be simply directed against the ideas of the assumption and the resurrection of Jesus. The Jewish legends relating to Jesus appear less inimical in character when compared with the parallel passages which are found in pagan authors and Christian sources, more especially, the, and the legends are fixed in frequently occurring themes of folklore and imaginations which have been especially excited by the historical importance which the figure of Jesus came to have for the Jews. Uh, the earliest authenticated passage ascribing, ascribing illegitimate birth to Jesus is that of Y-E-B, that's uh, short for, um, I think it's Yabamoth, Yibamoth. It's in the Talmud. Uh, Y-E-B 4, chapter 4 and verse 3. And I quote, the mysterious phase, the mysterious phrase, that man, unquote, cited in this passage is occurring in a family register with R. Simon, Simeon ben Azza is said to have found, seems to indicate that it refers to Jesus. See, Darren Borg in R.E.J. I. 23. And here occur... Also, the two expressions so often applied to Jesus in later literature, that anonymous one, the name of Jesus being avoided and bastard, for which in later times, something else was used, I can't read it, it's in Hebrew writing. Such a family register may have been preserved at Jerusalem in the Judeo-Christian community. All right, so... I think we've read enough for this, right? All right, sojourn in Egypt. Remember um, uh, Joseph of Arimathea? I mean, I'm sorry. Joseph took Mary, not Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph, Joseph and Mary took Jesus and went to Egypt, remember, to escape Herod? So, sojourn in Egypt, uh, Jewish Encyclopedia. The sojourn of Jesus in Egypt is an essential part of the story of his youth. According to the Gospels, he was in that country in his early infancy. But Cel Celsus, C-E-L-S-U-S, -S, says that he was in service there and learned magic. He was in service there and learned magic. Hmm... Hence, he was there too in early manhood. This assumption may serve to throw more light on the obscure history of Jesus than the account found in the Gospels. The Talmud also said that Jesus was in Egypt in early manhood. R. Joshua B. Para, P. E. R. A. H. Y. A. H. is said to have fled with his people Jesus to Alexandria in order to escape the persecutions of the Jewish king Y. A. N. N. A. I. Um. Let's see. Oh, we got to keep reading this. Uh, so, R. Joshua B. P. E. R. A. H. Y. A. H. is said to have fled with his pupil Jesus to Alexandria. So, they're saying Jesus learned from this Joshua guy. Uh, to have fled with his pupil Jesus to Alexandria in order to escape the persecutions of the Jewish king. Yanai, Y-A-N-N-A-I. On their return, Jesus made a made a remark on the not faultless beauty of their hostess, whereupon our Joshua excommunicated him. And when Jesus approached him again and was not received, he set up a brick for his God and led all Israel into apostasy. That's recorded in the Talmud in Sanhedrin 107b, S-O-T-A-H 47a, Y-E-R dot H A G seventy seven D. Um so you know they're they're basically saying that you know Jesus learned magic in Egypt, right? All right. Um 
All right, the next article, Jesus as Magician. According to Celsius, Celsius in origin, Contra Celsum I-28 and the Talmud, SHAB 104b, Jesus learned magic in Egypt and performed his miracles by means of it. The latter work, in addition, states that he cut the magic formulas into his skin. It does not mention, however, the nature of his magic performances. But as it states that the disciples of Jesus healed the sick in the name of Jesus, Pandera. Now, the reason they say Jesus Pandera is because they say that Mary, Mary, who bore Jesus in her womb, was a whore, a prostitute, who got pregnant by a Roman soldier named Pandera. Sometimes they spell it P-A-N-D-E-R-A, -E and other times I've seen it spelled P-A-N-T-E-R-A. So a Roman soldier named Pandera got Mary pregnant when he uh, paid her whatever, 10 pieces of silver and whatever. You know, she was a whore. So, do you know that me quoting this um, is probably makes me guilty of that anti-Semitism law? And if I go to England or Germany or France, I get arrested and soon coming to the United States. You should look up the Noahide laws. The United States um, passed a law, the Noahide laws, N-O-A-H-I-D-E. I did a Bible study on it, so if you do a search, you'll find it. But uh, basically, the first law of Noah, as recorded in the Talmud, because it's not in the Bible, um, basically says that if you worship a false god, you should be put to death as a heretic. Well, what do they think about Christians and Jesus? Well, I just told you. There was a famous man by the name of Voltaire, V-O-L-T-A-I-R-E. And he made a statement. He says, if you want to know who rules your country and who rules you, who is your master, find out who you're not allowed to criticize. And I think that's a very, very good thing to understand. So, anti-Semitism. Isn't that interesting? It's, it's no longer, you're not going to be allowed to criticize the Israelis dropping bombs on unarmed men, women, and children to kill them, to take their land, to put more settlements for Jews. Murdering Christians. I'm wondering very much what Jesus is going to say when the so-called church in the United States who supported this, the killing of Christian Palestinians, obviously not all the Palestinians are Christians, but there's a lot of them, being murdered by technically what the Bible calls the Antichrist. Those that listen to me on a regular basis, I'm, I, I apologize if it seems like I preach on the same stuff over and over, but I have to make the assumption that there are new listeners. All right, let's take a look at what the Bible says about Jerusalem. We'll just read a few quick verses here. Isaiah chapter 3 and verse 8. For Jerusalem is ruined and Judah is fallen because their tongue and their doings are against. Because their tongue and their doings are against the Lord to provoke the eyes of his glory. Jeremiah 4.14, O Jerusalem, wash thine heart from wickedness that thou mayest be saved. 
How long shall thy vain thoughts lodge within thee? Jeremiah 8 and verse 5. Why then is this people of Jerusalem slidden back by a perpetual backsliding? They hold fast deceit. They refuse to return. Now listen to this. Uh, the Lord got angry with Jerusalem because they were so evil and wicked. Jeremiah 9, 11, And I will make Jerusalem heaps and a den of dragons. Who's the dragon? Revelation says the dragon was the devil and Satan. And I will make Jerusalem heaps and a den of dragons. And I will make the cities of Judah desolate without an inhabitant. Jeremiah 13, 2, 27, I have seen thine adulteries and thy nangs the lewdness of thy whoredom and thine abominations on the hills and the fields. Woe unto thee, O Jerusalem! Wilt thou not be made clean? When shall it once be? Ouch! And everybody says, Oh, Jerusalem, that's the city of the Lord. Well, yeah, it is, but the, the you know, this is the bad stuff, right? Jeremiah 19.3 and say, Hear ye the word of the Lord, O kings of Judah, inhabitants of Jerusalem. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. Behold, I will bring evil upon this place, the which whosoever heareth his ears shall tingle. Jeremiah 23, 14. I have seen also in the prophets of Jerusalem an horrible thing. They commit adultery and walk in lies. They strengthen also the hands of evildoers, that none doth return from his wickedness. They are all of them unto me as Sodom, and the inhabitants thereof as Gomorrah. Book of Lamentations 1 8. Jeremiah hath, I'm sorry, um, the Lamentations of Jeremiah, chapter 1, verse 8. Jerusalem hath grievously sinned. Therefore she is removed. All that honored her despise her, because they have seen her nakedness. Yea, she sigheth and turneth backwards. You tired of hearing about Jeremiah? How about Ezekiel? Chapter 16, and verse 2. Son of man caused Jerusalem to know her abominations. You know, there's a difference between sin and abominations. I mean... There's not very many things that the Lord calls abominations. But, um, you know, lying and stealing, that's sin. Sodomy, witchcraft, that's an ab those are abominations. Okay, how about Malachi 2 and verse, chapter 2, verse 11? Judah hath dealt treacherously. And an abomination is committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah hath profaned, profaned the holiness of the Lord, which he loved and hath married the daughter of a strange God. How about Revelation chapter 11, verse 8? Talking about the two witnesses that come to Jerusalem. The two witnesses of the Lord. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Huh. The great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. I don't know about you, but my Lord, Jesus, who is the Christ, was crucified in Jerusalem. So, and it's spiritually called Sodom and Egypt. Matthew 23, 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets. Thou that killest the prophets? And stonest them which are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, 
and ye would not. All right, so you can get in trouble for anti-Semitism, for criticizing what the Israelis are doing to the Christian Palestinians, or go to prison. You can go to prison in many countries in Europe for questioning the six million Holocaust thing. But if you want to point out all the Catholic priests that have been sodomizing the altar boys, you can't get in trouble for that, can you? Not in the United States, not in Germany, not in France, not in England. Why is that? Everybody tells me, oh, oh, it's Rome. Rome's the Catholic, the Roman Catholic Church and the Pope. That's the, um, they're the ones that run everything in the world. Really? Really? They run the banking system with names like Goldberg and Silverstein and Cohen? Really? Let's see what the Bible says about Rome. Romans chapter 1, King James Bible. Paul, verse 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. Isn't it amazing all the Antichrist messianic so-called Jews will tell you Paul's a false apostle. Does this sound like false apostle? He says, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, holy scriptures, his son Jesus Christ our Lord, seed of David according to the flesh. Verse 4. And declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship, grace and apostleship, for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom are ye also called, the called of Jesus Christ. Yeah, it sounds like a really false apostle, doesn't it? Talks about grace, resurrection, holiness, faith, the gospel. And he says, Jesus Christ. Yeah, this is why they hate Paul. Let's read Romans chapter 1 and verse 7. Well, let's read 6. Among whom are ye also the called of Jesus Christ, to all that be in Rome, to all that be in Rome, beloved or beloved, beloved of God, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord. Okay. Now, that's not saying everybody, um, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I understand that not everybody in Rome was beloved of God, called to be saints. But, you know, that's, what can I tell you? Romans chapter 2, verse 16. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel, behold, thou art called a Jew and restest in the law, and makest thy boast of God. Don't you hear that today? You got the Judaizers, you got the Messianic Jews, you got the Torah keepers. They love to call themselves Jews, and they rest in the law. They make their boasts of God. Oh, we keep the law. We keep the law. Behold, thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law, and makest thy boast of God. And knowest his will, and approvest the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law. And art confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which hast the form of knowledge and of the truth in the law. Thou therefore that teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that preachest a man, 
should not steal. Dost thou steal? Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you. Did you catch that? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you. You know, when the Jews run around saying, oh, we keep the law, we keep the law, and they're do nothing but stealing and, and sucking on baby penises after they perform the circumcisions to get the blood off, and, and commit adultery and, and rob people of their pensions through their schemes. Yeah, the Gentiles will blaspheme the name of God because of them. For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you. As it is written, for circumcision verily profiteth, if thou keep the law. But if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee, who by the letter and circumcision does transgress the law? For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. How about, let's read Acts chapter 28. Verse 15, we'll start. Uh, and from thence, when the brethren heard of us, they came to meet us as far as APPII Forum and the three taverns. Whom, when Paul saw, he thanked God and took courage. And when we came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard, but Paul was suffered, or allowed, but Paul was suffered to dwell by himself with a soldier that kept him. And it came to pass that after three days, Paul called the chief of the Jews together. And when they were come together, he said unto them, Men and brethren, though I have committed nothing against the people or the customs of our fathers, yet was I delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of of the Romans. Huh. He was delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. Verse 18. Who? We're talking about who? The Romans. Who? When they examined me, would have let me go because there was no cause of death in me. But when the Jews spake against it, I was constrained to appeal unto Caesar. But when the Jews spake against it, I was constrained to appeal unto Caesar. Not that I have, not that I had ought to accuse my nation of. For this cause, therefore, I have caused you to see you and to speak with you, because that for the hope of Israel, I am bound with this chain. And they said unto him, We neither receive letters out of Judea concerning thee, neither any of the brethren that came showed or spake any harm of thee. But we desire to hear of thee what thou thinkest, for as concerning this sect, what sect? The Christians. For as concerning this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. Oh, yeah. Yeah, concerning the sect, they're spoken against. And when they had appointed him a day, there came many to him into his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets, from morning till evening. Boy, Paul, Paul was a man of many words. Let me tell you something. Verse 24, And some believe the things which were spoken, and some believe not. 
And when they agreed, not among themselves, they departed. After that, Paul had spoken one word, well spake, he said, okay, uh, this is what he's saying. And after that had sp uh, spoken one word, well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah, that's Isaiah, the prophet unto our fathers, saying, go unto this people and say, hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see and not perceive. For the heart of the people is rax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. Be it therefore, oh, I'm sorry, be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles and that they will hear it. And when he had said these words, the Jews departed and had great reasoning among themselves. And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came in unto him, preaching the gospel, I'm sorry, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. Oh, yeah. All right, let's take a look at uh, just a couple verses. Who killed the prophets and the saints? Revelation 18.24 And in her, Mystery Babylon, and in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. Revelation 16, 6. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. Okay. Revelation 17, verse 6. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints, with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. So, Babylon, Mystery Babylon killed the prophets. I mean, that's what the book of Revelation says, right? The prophets. Jesus speaking in Luke 13, 33. I think Jesus and the Bible should be our authority and interpret the Bible. The Bible interprets the Bible. I haven't read Rome anywhere yet, have you? Jesus speaking, Luke 13, 33. Nevertheless, I must walk, I must walk today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet perish out of Jerusalem. Huh. For it cannot be that a prophet perish out of Jerusalem? And Mystery Babylon killed the prophets? Uh when I took algebra in college, if A equals B equals C. Um, if Babylon killed the prophets and Jerusalem killed the prophets, that means Jerusalem has to be Babylon? But wait a minute, I've always been told it was Rome. Or is it Mecca? Or is it New York City? Or is it London? Or whatever. How about Jesus in Matthew 23, 37? O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets? Huh. How about Paul? 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 14 through 16. This is why they hate Paul. For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which indeed Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. Even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets. Even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us, and they please not God, and are contrary to all men. And they please not God, and they please not God, and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their sins always. For the wrath 
is come upon them to the uttermost. Do you know that God's wrath is upon the Jews? Can you show me from the Bible where Rome or Islam kill the prophets? Uh, no. Well, you know, and if you don't believe, you know, the Bible, what can I tell you? It wasn't Rome that killed the prophets. The prophets were sent to Jerusalem and Israel and Judah. Now, I think I'm going to um, do a more in-depth study. Of, this is going to be part two, I guess. I'm not sure what to call this. Um, the Jewish Jesuit connection or anti-Semitism, whatever. Um, but I'm planning on retiring soon. I would like to retire from my job. I'm not eligible for Social Security for over a year early Social Security, and I'm going to get a very small pension from work, probably about 40% of what I'm making now, but they want to uh, change my hours and make me work midnights, and I just, I'm getting too old to be doing this, and I think what I'm going to do is take my pension, my small pension, and retire from there. Hopefully, Social Security will still be around in a, over, a little over a year when I collect early Social Security. Then I'll be in pretty good shape for as long as the economy lasts. But I'm going to probably try to get another job at uh, full-time or part-time or whatever during more reasonable hours than working midnights. So they actually want me to work 12-hour shifts all night. I mean, really, you know... 12-hour shifts, working midnights. I just, I'm getting too old for that. So, you know, I want to do, I'd like to do uh, trust in the Lord and do some more Bible studies. And, you know, if I'm working those kind of crazy hours, I'm not going to be able to do many Bible studies. It takes a lot of uh, research for me to do these. It really does. And um, so... I might do a like a GoFundMe thing, and, and, and if any of you want to, you know, help me and contribute so I can do stuff more full-time, uh, I'll probably put it up soon, so, you know, I, I'd appreciate it. I've been doing this for years, and I've never, never asked for um, donations, but I might need to. I, I, I might really need to, at least until I can get another job or... Or whatever but if any of you want to help me out that would be great it'd be greatly appreciated um, but you know the Bible Jesus said freely you have received freely give and all these people on TBN and 700 Club that uh, buy my book a praise of Jesus it's only 1995 and plus shipping and handling a praise of Jesus and I'll tell you the gospel story uh, just unbelievable, you know. I just, I just can't do that. Everything that I put out is uncopyrighted. All glory to Jesus. What can I tell you? All right, so I guess it's going to be part two. Um, I might post this twice. You never know. All right. Well, all blessings, praise, glory, and honor to. Jesus, who is the Lamb of God, slain before the foundation of the world, in his precious name. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. It's Chaplain Bob signing off. Amen. <laughs>